Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Um, this panel is titled Managing Risk, Opportunities, uh, and uh, Challenges, Investing in the Region. Uh, my name is Faisal Hamza. I'm the Deputy Minister for Investment Development at the Ministry of Investment. Uh, and we're glad to see you here today, those of you who've stayed. Uh, I'll take the opportunity to let the panel first introduce themselves one by one, and then we'll move right into the discussion. You want me to? Yep. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Brian Hosking. I'm the Managing Director of Golden Minerals, uh, which is a company which has been exploring in Saudi Arabia since 2009. And during that time, we've actually been able to discover two projects. The most recent of those projects is the, uh, what we call our Hawea project. And last week, we announced uh, the mineral resource of 25 million tons, um, which is uh, all mineable. It's a VMS project, which means that it is a project containing both gold, copper, zinc, and silver. And now we're on our way to completing our PFS in this, pro in this project, and we hope that we'll be able to um, develop this project within the next two years. Um, how did I get here? Well, I guess it was by accident, but I've been working with our, one of our international partners, Kefi Minerals, and they asked me to, three years ago to come and take over and run this business. So I've had three years experience in Saudi Arabia. It's been a great experience. It's had its challenges and with all of these things, but I'm very delighted to be here present today. Thanks. Okay, next. My name's Richard Clark. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Orca Gold, Inc. And uh, Orca is a company that's been operating and exploring and now developing in the country of Sudan, which is right next door to Saudi Arabia across the Red Sea. Um, I am part of the management group and have been for almost 20 years of the Lundin Group. And uh, Orca is associated with that group. And prior to Orca, I ran a company for the group called Redback <coughs> Minerals. And Redback was very successful in discovering and building mines in Ghana and in Mauritania and uh, we went from nothing, and in 2010, we were producing approximately 550,000 ounces of gold. Uh, we sold that company to Kinross Gold, another Canadian company, in 2010, and then after that, my group uh, launched Orca. And uh, again, as we're going to talk here in, about Saudi, Saudi Arabia, um, a country that has effectively been pretty much missed by the international mining community certainly Sudan for different reasons than, than Saudi, but um, certainly huge, huge opportunity, uh, which we uh, have proven up by the discovery of a major deposit up near the Egyptian border. So very excited to be here and talk about our experiences in investing in this part of the world and um, what, what might be possible to encourage other investors. Stefan. Okay, so guten Tag, how we say it in Germany to the audience. My name is Stefan Müller. I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Frankfurt-based investment banking boutique DGWA with branches in Berlin and now in Dubai as well. Um, originally one of the uh, largest or maybe the largest German-speaking investor in the mining industry in the early 2000s, I set up that bank to help mainly the international companies who are looking to achieve a serious footprint both in the financial and in the corporate world in Europe in the mining sector since most of the mining companies are not European companies like we see here. It's changing dramatically now, especially due to the EV boom, and there's lots of happening, especially in Germany. Um, <clears throat> so we have an idea how a country that is not exactly on the map of the mining industry can, can change that. Um, with our rep office in Dubai, we are now looking to help some of our clients um, to expand into Saudi Arabia as well, since what we hear and see and read here today should be very interesting for them as well. So if some of you are looking for support, money-wise, corporate-wise, Meet me later. <laughs> okay. Bernhard? Yeah, hello, Bernhard Hartmann. I think Stefan just stole my punchline. I know. Uh, <laughs> it's quite rare that you see two Germans next to each other in a, in a panel here in the Middle East. Uh, I'm the managing director of Partners in Performance, uh, a consultancy that had originated 40 years ago in Australia 
working very closely with the, the global mining industry. Here in the Middle East, we have a much broader focus. We work around energy transition and achieving this massive transformation in the energy sector. And again, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. Uh, there's a chance uh, we've left a seat open. There's a chance we may be joined by Her Excellency uh, Naila from uh, Tunisia. She's the Minister of uh, Energy Mines. Um, we, we expect her to join during the panel. Um, okay, we'll turn to the questions now. Uh, the first a few questions I'll ask to all the panelists, and then we'll follow on with individual questions for each panelist. So um, I'll, I'll start uh, at the far side with Bernhardt just to mix it up a little bit. Um, so there are multiple jurisdictions around the world competing aggressively for FDI. Uh, when you look at the Middle East region in general, uh, what do you see as being the factors that make the region potentially a good place to invest or start a business? And then as a follow-on, what's specific to Saudi Arabia do you see? Yeah. I think uh, the Middle East, and we talked a lot about that during the, during the day, has embarked on a massive transition away from a uh, hydrocarbon-based economy uh, into a fully diversified setup. And whenever you have change uh, on that dimension, it is a, a very rewarding time to come in here as, a, as, an, as an investor, as a, a player in the field. So the timing is right, and His Excellency Khalid al Fale has explained it very nicely earlier that Vision 2030, the first years of the vision, have now set the foundation for all of us to be successful in this market. What's special about Saudi Arabia? For me, a bit of an odd question. I operate now for more than a decade here and always very much enjoyed the momentum uh, it is the largest economy in the GCC. Uh, it has uh, a tremendous growth potential going forward, so it's almost a no-brainer why to be here and why to invest. Okay, thanks. Stefan? Yeah, I think this question was discussed in several panels this day. It's difficult to find new arguments, but as you said, the whole world is competing for money since ever. Um, but the region here, I mean, not, not only the location between Asia and Europe is brilliant. Um, they're also f fighting with challenges all the time, but, but lots of these countries have shown that they can do things, that they can set up industries. I mean, look what, what they built in Dubai, look what they plan to build here in, in, in the Neom City in the future. Um, things can happen here, not only because of the countries are very wealthy, but also because of the people are on a very high level when it comes to education. The, the life standard is very high, so you can attract international um, companies and their employees to come here. Um, logistically wise, it's a very, it's, everything is narrow. You, you can fly to Europe within six hours, to, to, uh, to Asia within six hours. Um, not that much downside, and uh, I can only copy paste what, what he said, not that I've not done business here yet, but uh, being the largest, um, the largest economy in the area and one of the most stable ones, not with issues some others have. Saudi Arabia is a solid business partner for, for lots of countries in the world. And uh, that is something that I don't see changing in the future. So th the arguments are very obvious. Okay, Rick? Look, I'll, I'll get a little practical in the sense that um, cer certainly my job is exploration, development, and, and construction of mines. And you know, the, the, the key thing for the exploration world, which I think Brian will speak on as well, is that you have to have the geology. And this part of the world, it, the geology, the potential has been known for quite a while, um, but it, has, it is completely, completely underexplored um, for primarily political reasons. That, and that, there's, we've seen dramatic changes in the region, which is allowing these economies to open up again for my industry and what we do. And the geology of the Nubian Shield is spectacular, and it's probably one of the last and most vast untapped geological regions of the world, and particularly in in Africa, and that's why you want to be here. So that's from a, a very basic level. On a development side, you then need to be able to operate in the country. You need infrastructure, you need support, you need uh, stability and regulation, you need to be able to understand it. You need to know that if you're going to invest your money, there's a chance of getting your money back in a reasonable amount of time. So it's really a contest um, between different jurisdictions as to where we're going to spend money 
in a geologically robust region. And certainly Saudi Arabia ticks pretty much all those boxes and they're continuing to improve on that basis. So, you know, I think the, again, the, uh, the potential here is, is pretty much unlimited. Um, the geology has been proven up predominantly by Madden to this stage. And if Saudi Arabia opens it up to exploration competition, which they are, seem to be doing in a big way, then you're going to see this region explode and it's going to be very, very exciting. Great, thank you. Uh, Brian? Well, I, I've got nothing to say. Rick has said it all. <laughs> um, but I, I can only echo Rick's words. Uh, you know, when you think about this region and you think about it from a geological point of view, you think of the Arabian Nubian Shield and where does that cover? It comes from Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan into Egypt. And then the big, big slice of it is here in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, it's a tier one location. And you know what? It has been underexplored. And that's the opportunity for explorers like Rick and myself. So that's really, I think, is the... But we also kind of have been... I've been hearing this kind of Arabian Nubian shield story for quite a while. But one forgets about the Tethian belt mm. and the Tianxin uh, belt which runs through from Kazakhstan to Kyrgyzstan and into Turkey and, and across into Cyprus and up into, into uh, you know, Serbia and Co. This, this region has the potential to become the mining hub of the world. We've talked about um, South America as the kind of copper hub. This region has the opportunity now and I think it needs to, to seize that opportunity to develop itself into the major next resource hub in the world. So I think that's the first thing. What, why come to uh, Saudi Arabia? Well, I, I, I won't even answer that. We've been here since 2009. We've always believed in this country, and we've seen only good things out of it from an exploration point of view. Yes, it's been tough, but that's the exploration business. If it was too easy, then everybody would do it. So we think that this is absolutely a tier one location from an exploration point of view. And we also see that we haven't had much opportunity. So that we've been able to pick ground, which is now beginning to uh, produce and deliver the results uh, that, that we'd hoped for originally. Great, thanks, uh, Brian. And uh, since you went last, well, this time we'll, we'll let you go first. Uh, <laughs> the second question to all the panelists is, conversely, uh, what do you see as the main challenges when considering investing in the region, and again, in, in, in particular, Saudi Arabia? I, I'm going to be pretty blunt about this, and I'm not going to speak for long on it. Uh, this region has a problem, and it's a problem of perception. You know, once I, I've spent three years in the country, and that perception has changed dramatically. Um, it's a wonderful country, wonderful people. I've only met with kindness and, and uh, you know, support from, from the region. But internationally, the perception has been negative, and I would imagine that that's the same as applies to Rick. Rick? No, I, I agree with Brian. Uh, the biggest issue this region faces is, is perception. Um, there's a lot of change happening for all sorts of reasons in different countries. Um, certainly here, and, and we all know a lot about them and, and the developments and, and the leaps forward. Um, very impressive. In Sudan, for example, which I know well, they are a people struggling uh, to get out of 25 years of military dictatorship and turn that society into a democracy. Well, I'm sorry, that doesn't happen easily and there's going to be bumps on the roads. But the perception is that, you know, it must be a horrible place. Um, because of that, it's not. In fact, it's a, it's a place that should be, that the people should be lauded because they're making a huge cultural and societal change to come into the world and open their economy up. And as, as like Brian, we've been there a long time and have taken advantage. The people are amazing, kind. Um, hospitable, uh, educated, and respectful. Um, it's been a real joy to work there. And, and so people like Brian and I and others have to come out and, and talk about the reality of working in these countries and try to um, you know, paint the correct picture, not the picture that's painted by the major news agencies that are looking for sensationalism. Stefan? 
Yeah, the, I think the problem is, is not that the problems are here, because of all of us who are here and, and who work in the country or with the country realize that the changes are dramatically. The problem is that the investors or those who may uh, think about moving here, they had, as you said in the beginning, the whole world is competing for money, the whole world is going green, there's projects everywhere, so if you're uh, not for yeah. so if you're uh, not focused on the region but focused for example on the mining industry you find other restrictions where you can go easier and you do not have to explain to your shareholders or whatever your fund investors why you go to Saudi Arabia or to, to another country in the area um, the problem is or the challenge for the country and the area is to go out and tell the people not only tell the people that the things are changing make it possible for the people to, to follow it. It's not enough when women now can play soccer or whatever. This is what you read in the German newspapers. It's, that's just what happens. And then you read the downside events that we have here and there. That's, that's a big challenge because of the people are not really willing <coughs> to, to change their investment strategy, for example. They do what they have done all the time. The good thing is that the mining industry is one of the very few, or maybe the only industry, that cannot choose where they operate. I mean, a mine is where the resource is. If SAP is thinking about a new lab for software engineers, they will not consider Saudi Arabia or the Congo or something like that. Um, but if you are a mining uh, firm or a mining investor, you have to deal with these issues. And these people and companies deal with these issues since ever. They operate mines in countries where you would not go into vacation. And vacation here is one of the things that may come in the future as well to, to show the, the world that this country is changing. Um, that is the challenge, to do things outside the country to show the people who may come here that they should come here. Okay, thank you. Bernhard? Uh, allow me to, to address your question from a somewhat different angle. I think as a, as a consultant in the kingdom, I have the unique opportunity to compare different sectors with each other as they are embarking on that journey of transformation. And I think we talked throughout the day a lot about uh, what's happening in, in, in the mining sector, and it's all exciting. Uh, if I look, and I work a lot uh, in that sector too, if I look at uh, the power sector, you have a story that might be very helpful to elaborate a bit on what are challenges as I see them. It's a sector that had a, a relatively clearly defined blueprint of transformation out of Vision 2030. It is about uh, private sector participation. It's about unbundling. Uh, and of course, it is a regulated business to some extent. So building this kind of regulatory footprint was very, very important. And a lot of it has happened. But still, at the heart of the industry, you have one massive incumbent. Uh, the unbundling, in reality, hasn't gone far. It is more or less on paper in the books, but not really reality. And the change of transformation is directionally clear. When you look at the, the generation portfolio, the move from hydrocarbons to renewables, uh, the massive efforts uh, about connecting the kingdom physically from a power grid perspective into the region, all that is clear, but it's very unclear about when all this in, in terms of big projects will happen. So timing, momentum, in my book at least, uh, has, has been lost a bit. And of course, that is for investors a very difficult position to, to come in, specifically around a, a massive incumbent in the industry. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, now we'll ask individual questions to each of you. Uh, we'll start with Brian. Brian, you're already uh, an investor here in the mining sector. How has your experience been as you explore and seek to establish a mining business in the kingdom? And be blunt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I would be very popular if I was too blunt. So, um, you know, thanks for that question. It's, it's I'm reading a fascinating book at the moment, and, and, and I'm digressing here a little bit. It, it's called Being Young, Male, and Saudi. And it's a book written by a, a, a lecturer at King Fahd University, and, and it's, it's a research project where he's interviewed literally thousands of young Saudi men and, and, and try to get their mood of, of where the country is going in terms of, of this transformation that's been happening. And I'd like to, to read one quote out of this book, which is 
really by way of answering this question. Is, he says, startup businesses not only provide essential knowledge of the commercial world, but they also increase national productivity. Indeed, startups are seen as benefiting Saudi Arabia nationally as they provide new services and increase job opportunities. Now, I think he here was referring to the technology sector. But exploration businesses are startup businesses. They, they depend on shareholder capital and investment. And they start, I started three years ago with a team of five people. I now have 50 people in the team. But we're in startup mode. And I said to my shareholders when I came and got involved here the three years ago, that as far as I saw this, if we were going to succeed, we had to get three things clear from the thing. One is that we had to be in prospective ground. Two, we had to have solid shareholder support along the way. And three, we needed the intellectual and manpower capital to actually be able to ex do what we wanted to do in the region. I'd add a fourth thing now with, with, with a bit of hindsight. And that is we need the right kind of regulatory environment to allow startup businesses to, to happen. And I, and I make the point because I think that when Saudi companies and Saudi people think of the mining industry, they think of Marden and they think of Aramco. We're not neither of them. We're a small startup business and we have to become lean and, and operate as such. So let's deal with those three questions. Tick the box on, on prospectivity of the ground. This is a tier one location. And you know what? The attractive thing is that we're the only real explorer at the moment actively working in this country. So we have an open field and we've been able to select ground, so much so that we, we, in the five licenses that we were granted over the last 10 years, we have made two discoveries. That's a 40% success rate. From an exploration point of view, that's phenomenal. I think the second one is shareholder support, and I'd like to come back to that because there's a nuance to that. The third is I've been really extremely lucky. I have a really talented young team, and I've been able to recruit some of the best and brightest young Saudi geologists to join our team, and, and they represent the future. Not only young Saudi male geologists, but also I've been able to recruit, and 30% of our workforce are now female, and, and what's interesting is the nature of transformation that they've brought to our business. So that's, um, I think we've ticked those three boxes. I'd like to go back to read what Mark Thompson said uh, in addition to, to that, because he has the bad news. He said, and I read, certainly there are a myriad of challenges that young Saudi entrepreneurs need to overcome, not least the fact that many regulations are either out of date or unclear, or in fact are considered to be the largest pain points. For many Saudi, young Saudis, the conclusion is that it is simply too complex to start a business. He goes on further to quote, and I quote, additionally some argue that the procedural complexity of the Nitikat system works against entrepreneurs. Many young Saudis believe that one way to increase the number of young people entering the workforce and simultaneously enhance job satisfaction is greater encouragement of entrepreneurship. Now, we can debate those two statements. They're quite inflammatory in many ways. And I, you know, I don't think this is the right place to be debating them. But many of the points that he raises here resonate with my own experience. <clears throat> I think I've said enough about that, and I'd like, like to come back to the last point. And we, uh, we're a, a company which is supported by two shareholders. It's Kefi, which is an AIM-listed company, and the Al-Rashid family, which is a well-respected and well-known Saudi business 
family. They've been, both of them have been a constant supporter to us over the last 10 or 12 years. And it's not been without its challenges and all of those kind of things. And we've spent over the last 10 years nearly $30 million in exploration. So, you know, these things are, sometimes we focus overly much on international capital. And the point that I would want to make is, is that Saudi is, has an endowment here of huge local capital. And I would, I would guess that a family like the Al-Rashids are well known in the community and that the local business community are looking at their battles and their success to get us going. If we succeed, money will flow into this industry not from international sources, but from local sources. If we fail, those people who are teetering on the edge of whether they should be investing Saudi money in Saudi exploration may think twice. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question uh, for Bernhardt. Uh, we'll go out of order this time. <laughs> um, among the most important challenges for businesses and investors globally uh, is the management of ESG, which comes up on every panel. Today. Uh, as you look at the Middle East, what's your perception of the main ESG challenges uh, for businesses operating in the region? Yeah, you're indeed right. When you listen to today's program, ESG was literally on any, on any panel. For good reasons, I have to say. Uh, it's really impressive. And I focus uh, on, 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 on the kingdom now. Uh, the broad amount of initiatives that uh, improve the situation around the environment, governance. Um, for me here, one of my, my hobby horses is really the, 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 the cyclic uh, uh, industry. I think we need to get away from the landfills all over the place. It's a pretty uh, topic pretty dear to me. But what I want to talk about is um, the, the social side of these ESG uh, elements. When you look at um, a, a number of the programs that are right now pushed strongly, let me start with Saudization. Uh, you mentioned Nitakat just now. I think this is a, a, a critical program as part of Vision 2030 to create meaningful jobs for the, the, the young kingdom, uh, the young uh, generation of the kingdom. Uh, another very critical element is diversity. For me, working in the, in the country, the most amazing change has happened really uh, with many of my clients by raising the amount of females in the workforce dramatically in the last two or three years. Massive change. Uh, another program uh, that we all follow with a lot of interest came, as so many other programs, came from Aramco uh, ICTVA, a program that really pushes local content for the big companies down the, the supplier chain that they develop, where, as you all probably know, the suppliers are uh, literally evaluated around how many Saudi employment uh, do they generate, uh, do they have R&D in the country, do they produce locally, uh, and the likes. Now, at the end, all these programs focus on developing the, the, the local labor sector massively. And uh, there's really nothing bad about that, but all in all, for foreigners coming to the country, indeed, it is a challenge. And the challenge in my book cannot be addressed by um, being in, in Saudi Arabia and managing a predominantly Saudi workforce from outside of the country. I think uh, it is very important for players here in the kingdom, investors and established companies, to bring all the support functions into the country. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to see that this is happening now. Uh, many, many uh, large international companies bring at least their regional heads into the kingdom now, and that changes uh, the perspective on managing uh, 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 the whole labor diversity element in a, in a meaningful way. I think it's a challenge, but it's going to be addressed right now. Okay, thanks, Bernard. 
Uh, Rick, the next question for you. Since you're already in the mining sector in the region in Sudan, uh, what needs to happen in the kingdom in, in Saudi Arabia to attract investors like you here? Um, I think, <clears throat> as we've all talked about, I think that um, Saudi is, is, has launched itself in the, in the right direction uh, to do that, as are a number of other uh, countries in the region. Um, I think, as Bernard said, one of the, the real advantages that Saudi has over, say, Sudan and, and other uh, countries in the, in the Nubia and Arabian Shield area is the infrastructure it has, um, the, it, the ability to set up operational and technical offices here um, and to mobilize and, quite frankly, even set up head offices here, uh, if that's the way um, the, the business goes. And a lot of the other countries are not quite there yet. So Saudi's very much advanced and, and ahead of the game in many respects um, in that regard. The, the other things are, it, it, and, and I'll go really to exploration, uh, development side on this, and that is that the system has to be as transparent as possible. Competition has to exist. Um, if you're an explorer, an international explorer, and you're going to come in and, 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 again, we've touched on this, and, and feel that you're behind the eight ball already because there's an elephant in the room that you cannot compete with, that's, that's going to be a big decision for international exploration companies to come and spend money. Because exploration is, it takes a long time and it's very expensive. To give you an idea, for us to go from discovery to making a production decision in Sudan is about $80 million. That is a, it's a, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of time and you're not going to invest that if you think at the end of the day there's a chance that you may not be able to get something forward or you may have conflict with, with the asset. So that has to be clear. The other thing is transparency of the regulations, the laws, the fiscal the fiscal stability, um, again, Saudi is, 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 is and is continuing to be advanced in that regard. And that's going to give people like me a lot of comfort and, and outside investors a lot of comfort in terms of being able to structure your affairs to not only spend the money wisely but get it back at the end of the day once you're producing whatever minerals you're, you're looking for. So I, I really think that Saudi Arabia is going in the right direction. It can definitely do more. It can be more competitive. It can stand out, I think, as the place to be, um, certainly from that aspect uh, going forward in the next few years. Again, as Bernard has touched upon, um, I think one thing that's very important for everyone to understand that mining dollars are predominantly generated by the international investment community. And the international investment community is re really driving our ESG, okay? And one of the factors that we've, they're focusing on for public companies in North America, Australia, Europe, is the diversity issue. And it's going to be extremely difficult for us to attract large amounts of money for regions that are not pushing or moving forwards um, in diversity. So that's important as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, last question for Stefan. Uh, beyond mining, what other sectors uh, do you think are ideally, ideally suited to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Uh, and, um, uh, and what actions do you think uh, the Kingdom could take to attract those? Well, I see one very obvious sector and the other one is a bit more a, a vision. Um, local production. I, I had the pleasure to drive around Riyadh uh, through Riyadh yesterday and I saw a fast growing rich city and all we heard about the changes in the, yeah, in the, in the social life mean that, that there will be more wealth coming into the country which means the people want to eat more, they want to eat better and stuff like that. So the agriculture sector uh, with a lot of challenges to be able to feed the people with, with local production here in the desert, that's something <clears throat> that should create based on the knowledge, the money uh, of the people should create some very interesting projects that m may be used or can be used as blueprints for other poorer countries in, in Africa. Because that's one of the biggest challenges in the world, to keep Africa alive. That's other than the flood somewhere in the Maldives um, that comes soon. Um, the other sector is something, is, is a sector that I see very fast growing. If everything we ask the kingdom to do to be an attractive uh, investment area will come soon is not soon but will be a result of that is tourism mm. because of I mean other than for example Dubai 
which, can, which offers only nice weather and shopping centers. Uh, Saudi Arabia offers the same weather, the same location. It's easy for Europeans, easy for, for Asians. But it's, it can offer much more. It has a tradition. It has, it has old sites. It's more for the sophisticated traveler, let's say it this way. These people have concerns, usually a little bit older. They say, is it really the best to go there with my family or with my, with my, with my wife? If this is changing, then Saudi Arabia has reached the biggest goal to be, to be uh, seen as a completely uh, similar business and social and partner in all kinds like almost every other country in the world. And then tourism could be a very, very attractive sector. It's a huge country. It offers everything from, I, I learned you can, you can ski here. It, I, I didn't know that. It has beaches, it has old castles, buildings, whatever, a huge tradition. Um, this is a sector, it takes a couple of more years, but if people come for holidays here, then the money here comes easily. I couldn't agree with you more, and I think uh, the kingdom is ser very serious about um, growing that industry and is already starting to do that. And I think we'll see some significant changes and, and impressive results in the coming years. So right. uh, I concur with you. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, and so what I'd like to do is maybe in 30, 40 seconds each, if you could uh, just any uh, additional comments that you might have, and, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, we start with, uh, we'll start with Brian. <laughs> you always... Pick me first, hey? You're right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think we, we really said it all in, in terms of it. Um, I think that, you know, to sum up my, my perspective is regionally, this is a fascinating region. I think it's in transformation. I think many of the things in the Vision 2030 are really positive. I see huge energy and enthusiasm in this country. Um, <clears throat> And I think that if there is a roadblock and a message that I would want to be given, and that's the message that I give to the Deputy Minister of Mineral Resources every day, I just say to him one thing, is where are my licenses? <laughs> <laughs> because without licenses, we have no business. Rick? Yeah, I, I, one thing I, I, while I was sitting here, I thought about that that's also important in terms of the industry that we do. It, it, unfortunately, we all wish this was otherwise, but it never seems that you find a really major um, economic deposit near a big city. Um, so we're always out very much in the hinterlands and, uh, and therefore very, very uh, dependent upon community relations in, in different parts of, of these countries. And I, I think it's definitely the case here. And so one of the things that has to happen is we have to be able to go to our shareholders and the people that we are working very closely with, these communities, and be able to explain to them the benefits that they're going to get from our operation in order to get their support. Because without the support of the locals, it doesn't really matter um, what the central government does, uh, we will run into difficulties. So it's very, very important for us as companies to manage community relations, but also the central governments to encourage that and make it clear how wealth is going to be distributed as a result of our efforts. So I think that's another key thing to, to keep in mind as we're developing a, a, what I hope to be a huge mining business here in Saudi Arabia. Thanks. Stefan? Well, organizing such an event is somehow similar to, to operating a mining uh, project. It's, it needs a lot of logistics, organization, short-term issues to, to manage. And um, when I look at this event, in Saudi Arabia, which is not a mining country, and when I look to the largest mining show in the world, the PDAC in Toronto, how that is organized and how this year is organized, then Saudi Arabia has a bright future in the mining industry. That's <laughs> for sure. This is one of the greatest events I've ever been, especially in these days, hybrid, everything around COVID and the, the setup. So if you can do something like that, the mining's not a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bernhard. Yeah. Uh, Last word. Oh, wow. That's a, a <laughs> tough one. Look, uh, I mentioned earlier, I've been now roughly a decade here in the region, and the only other place where I spent so long as a professional was actually China. So I, I tend to sometimes compare the two systems, both massive transformations, um, directionally uh, well set out, and specifically here in the kingdom, I think... Uh, coming back to the statement around the foundation and what Vision 2030 in terms of direction will bring. 
uh, everything is clear. I, I understand that and I, I sign up for it. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. What the Chinese did very well was managing momentum throughout uh, almost two decades of change. And you asked a bit what is the ultimate challenge. I think the, the great work that the kingdom has achieved in the last four or five years around Vision 2030 really keep it, keep the momentum up and, and go forward. Great, very thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in, in thanking the panel. I think it was a great discussion. Uh, thank you very much and thank you all for being here.